librarians, welcome to episode 265 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 17th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. First of all, I'd love to give a very big congratulations to Amanda Chacon. Today, a School Library Journal announced that she is the 2024 School Librarian of the Year. I was so fortunate to have Amanda Chacon share her expertise on the podcast not once but twice, Episode 207, STEM Librarian, and Episode 242, Media Virtual Presence. I'll include a link to those episodes and to the School Library Journal announcement in the show notes. This week, I welcome two Michigan School Librarians, Jonathan Richards and Patrick Taylor, to have their say. Hello, my name is Jonathan Richards, and I'm a School Library Media Specialist at Owen Intermediate School in Belleville, Michigan, a part of Van Buren Public Schools. What makes School Library Media Specialists amazing is that we are resourceful, we are creative, and we are dedicated to helping students discover the truth in any subject. School library media specialists provide the resources for critical thinking and research with equal access to information as our foundation. Hello, School Librarians United listeners. My name is Patrick Taylor, and I am the district librarian for East Point Community Schools in East Point, Michigan. You may remember me from the two episodes uh, of School Librarians United that I have been on. The first one was called A Balancing Act, where Amy and I discussed completing the Master of Library and Information Science degree while working full-time as a school librarian. And the second is was Jack of All Trades, where I discuss the many, many hats that I wear for my district. My favorite library to visit while I'm on vacation, and I should preface this by saying I don't go on vacation very often, and it's rarely out of state. So this is in northern Michigan, the Elk Rapids Public Library, which is on the west side of the Grand Traverse Bay, is incredible. There's many things that I could say about it, but the best thing about it to me is that it's a library on a beach. What more could you ask for? So enjoy this week's episode. Friends, I'd love to include more voices on the show each week. If you are interested, consider sending your voice messages to schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. Your recording will be included in the very next episode. Visit today's show notes for 24 prompts and the instructions for submitting your voice messages to the show. Amanda Jones's upcoming book, That Librarian, will be available starting on August 27th, but you can pre-order your copy now. And if you use the indie bookseller Cavalier House Books in Amanda's hometown of Denham Springs, Louisiana, you'll get a signed copy. I've included a link in the show notes. When you look at the cover of Amanda's book, you might recognize the Freedom Fighter shirt that she's wearing. She reached out to the designer, Christy, who designed a line of That Librarian apparel, as well as That Librarian flair, such as a bag, sticker, and mug. I love that we can all be That Librarian who advocates for our library and our students' access to books. You will find a link to this online store in our show notes. Please note that 15% of the proceeds go to the Texas Library Association, as that is the home state of the designer. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on X, formerly known as Twitter. My handle is at LMS underscore United. On threads, you can find me at School Librarians United and on Blue Sky at SLU Podcast or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. Be sure to listen to episode 224. I announce a sponsorship with Literati Book Fairs, and now a chance to hear from one of Literati's team members, Michael. Michael Moradi, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Amy. You know, I'm dying to know, because I'll be honest, 
I've never had a literati book fair, but you know, could you tell us what are three things that you, as someone who supports librarians in their book fairs every day, what would you recommend to a school librarian to ensure a seamless and stress-free fair? Sure. So the first thing would be just be prepared for anything that might arise. We know things can get hectic with book fair week. So we like to keep our, our customers, our librarians prepared for when that book fair week does arrive. So one of the things that we see, for example, is we see a lot of schools have firewalls on their internet. So that could be a difficulty when setting up our, our cash registers, which are smart devices. Our smart devices are really user friendly, but with any kind of technology, there might be some scenarios where we see some hiccups, especially with those firewalls. Um, so I would say get in touch with your IT department. We do send our cash register guides three weeks in advance of the book fair. And in those cash register guides, we have those items that need to be whitelisted in order for our registers to fully connect to your internet. So get in touch with your IT department and make sure that's all set up before your book fair really does start. Another thing I would say is get an understanding of what's popular in your school with your students. Um, what titles that you see in your book fair catalogs that you can find in our open book resources will be popular with your students and be prepared to put in a replenishment order for those items when your book fair does arrive. And then finally, I mentioned our open book resources. Get familiar with that platform, log into open book, check out our resources, use our principal materials for promotion of your book fair. And then also log in and, and watch our webinar videos. We have a few videos that that all our book fair coordinators like to watch before the book fair begins just to be better prepared. Well, and it sounds like it to me, like a lot of these things are sort of, you know, sort of that rookie, that 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 first book fair that you host with Literati. And after that, you're not going to need to do these things again. You're not going to need to whitelist that, that register. You're not going to need to watch those orientation promos. But I, I'm grateful. I love a video. I love a little tutorial, a little hand-holding. You know, I, I, I imagine you enjoy doing this. I, I, I'm really grateful that you're joining us here today. Can you give us an idea? What are some of the things that you love about working for Literati? Sure. Literati is awesome. Being in the book fair department is amazing. Just bringing that, that book fair into the schools, just feeling that nostalgic factor. When I was a student, book fairs was always an awesome day um, during the school day. So you just get to go in, check out the book fair, Bring your catalog with you, circle the books that you are really wanting. You bring that home, show it to your parents. They're able to supply you with some money. You go to the book fair the next day and you're able to purchase some books. And I really like how Literati was able to take this book fair business and just bring to the schools in a new um, and improved and modern way. Fantastic. I hope you join us one more time. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today. I would love to, Amy. We'll see you next time. Friends, be sure to tune in to learn all about Literati and their very generous offer. Librarians who book their very first Literati book fair and mention the code UNITED when booking may qualify to receive a $500 gift card to Tidal Wave. Visit the link in today's show notes and call the Literati team to see if you qualify. And now a word from our sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning PebbleGo Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I'm so excited to be working with them. I'm also grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 6. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone interactive ebooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and ebooks on shop.capstonepub.com. And now for today's episode, Romance Book Club and my conversation with Lori Lieberman. Friends, I'm so excited. Lori Lieberman, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. You know what, friends, you have to know. Anyone who picks me up at the airport after 9 p.m. on a school night will forever have a special place in my heart. I loved meeting Lori in Oregon this past fall, and I especially loved getting to be a part of your annual conference. That was really fun, and I loved your keynote and the presentation that you did. Everyone was just wowed by everything that you had to say and do. It was great. 
Well, and I got to be honest, what an absolute treat to see another part of the country. And and I really sort of had an opportunity to just get to meet people. And we had this lovely drive out to the ocean and then go surround myself with all these amazing school librarians. We did an episode on, on the uh, Oregon School Librarians Association uh, in October. And I recommend you listen because they're absolutely inspiring stories. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the library that you work in, about the grades you serve, and the programs you offer. Because, friends, I got to go to Lori's library. I mean, that, that is, for me, that is such a, a wonderful opportunity to learn more about you as, as a librarian because I got to walk through your space and learn all about it. That's right. We snuck in there because we needed to grab some book pumpkins that were going to be auctioned off at the conference. I forgot about that. Yeah, that was funny. We just popped in there. Um, and it actually turned out, wasn't that same day, I think Angela Davis or the next day was going to be presenting something at Lincoln High School. That was crazy. Anyway, so I'm the teacher librarian at Lincoln High School in downtown Portland, Oregon. We are an IB school with a population of about um, 1,600, 1,700 students. And we moved into this beautiful new building in fall of 2022. And that's what Amy got to see. I was an elementary school librarian, a middle school librarian before before I became a high school librarian, which I think um, I'm stopping there. I was a law librarian at large law firms in San Francisco and Los Angeles before getting my master's in educational media. And I do a lot of fun programming in the library at Lincoln. I run Friday trivia lunches in the library that completely pack the place and are very, very fun. My library TAs make all sorts of seasonal creations out of old books. We've sold book turkeys, book pumpkins, book snow people. And of course, we have the Lincoln High School Romance Book Club, which is probably what I'm best known for. Lori, I'm curious, you know, how long have you sponsored the Romance Book Club in your high school? Because it's it's been a while. You've done this for a couple of years. Yeah. So I went to my first AASL in Louisville. I think that was... Was that 2019, I think? And I went and I loved it. And I was kicking myself. I was like, why have I not been going to this conference every two years? It's amazing. So I went and I loved all the sessions. And I remember sitting in like one of the areas and thinking to myself, I want to come back to this conference in two years and I want to present. And then I thought, what can I present on? What is, what's unique about me? And in the back of my mind, I was thinking this crazy idea I had about starting a romance book club with my students. There was a couple, there were a couple students who would talk to me about romance, adult romance that they were reading. And I'd say, oh, you know, I'd read that or I really like this. And we'd talk about like Penny Reed, who's an adult romance author. And we just kind of like share things, you know, back and forth, kind of very, we weren't super open about it. We weren't broadcasting this to everyone what we we're doing. We're just like having conversations about romance. And I thought, you know, we should really make this into a thing. And then I had a student, one of my favorite students, she was one of my library TAs, Gabby Schaefer. And Gabby's like, I want to do this. I want to, I want to start a romance book club. So I'm like, let's do it. So we went to my principal, who is so lovely and wonderful. And I think every time I go into her office, she's kind of rolls her eyes a little bit like, oh my God, what is going to happen? <laughs> what does she want now? What crazy idea is she cooking up? But we said we want to have a high school romance book club. We don't know of anyone else who's doing this. We want to do this. We don't want to just read YA romance. Like we've all read the Jenny Han books. No shade on Jenny Han. Those are great books. But we want to read some adult romance as well. And she said that I'm okay with that. She's like, she's, we, there's several books that the students read in their IB English classes that have pretty explicit content. So reading adult romance books shouldn't be a problem. And which is funny because I know that she's never read um, a romance book. So I don't know. I think if she read some of these, she would probably rethink this, but she's not going to listen to this podcast or she might. She's she might surprise me. So anyway, we started off. We'd like, let's do this. And the first book we chose was Red, White and Royal Blue by Casey McQuinston, which had recently won the an Alex Award. And we had a meeting. A bunch of people showed up, not just, you know, young girls, young boys, all sorts of kids showed up. And it was great meeting. Um, and then shortly thereafter, COVID hit and we decided to go virtual and we had a virtual visit with Madeline Miller, who does not write romance, but all my students love her book, The Song of Achilles, which is a very sad love story. She loved meeting 
with a high school romance book club. The first thing she said was, where was this when I was in high school? Which is what almost all the authors say. They, um, they love it and we love it. Well, and Lori, can I ask you, because so it sounds like you, you made these initial, you know, sort of start into to hosting this in person in 2019, but then you went virtual because of the pandemic. I'm almost wondering, given that the pandemic was such an alienating experience, we, we were sort of stuck at home, do you feel like having the the sort of inaugural year of the Romance Book Club is actually being virtual. Do you almost feel like like students could be more 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 open? And I mean, they're sitting at home looking at a screen, connecting with their peers, connecting with you in a way that is not academic. This is about about getting together with their friends and a, and a trusted adult to talk about romance novels. I think all of that is true. I also think it was such a horribly depressing, scary, anxiety-ridden time that reading romance was just the best thing that you could do for your brain, you know, just because romance is just always has that promise of a happily ever after or a happily for now. And that was what you needed. I remember reading, I mean, it wasn't, it's not a romance, but it's kind of romance adjacent reading House in the Cerulean Sea. And I remember finishing that book and thinking, this is the book that my heart needed right now. And then I think I bought like eight copies and I gave them to everyone. And my best friend did the same thing. She bought a bunch of copies and gave them to everyone as presents. So I think sometimes you need you need a romance book. They're, you know, they're great. They're they're they ser- they serve a purpose. Absolutely. And I know we're going to we're going to get back into into all the things that that really have evolved from you taking this step to to host this romance book club you started in 2019 and and obviously once your school moved in back into meeting in person your your book club uh kicked in into full gear can i ask you know as a club how often do you meet it's kind of irregular it really depends the the student leaders you know decide sometimes it's every 3 weeks to you know once a month they, we try and have a meeting where we say what the announce what the next book is going to be. And some months we really try and have a YA choice and an adult choice. Some months it's just a YA choice. Some months, yeah, it just kind of varies. You know, and then we have the meeting. A lot of times we have an author visit. They, they did a movie showing. Last year we watched the Kira Knightley Pride and Prejudice. I was out of town, but they kept screenshotting the hand flex and they were all sending that to me which was really funny and my phone was blowing up with that so it's kind of an irregular sort of sort of thing it's not like we have you know the first tuesday of every month that's fantastic Incredibly fortunate, friends. When uh, we were in Tampa a couple weeks later after your conference was the uh, AASL's uh, annual conference in Tampa, and I was so lucky to see you present on this topic. You know, as a devoted romance reader, what are the reasons which you feel and you feel you feel strongly that students should have an opportunity to join a romance book club? We read romance because we love love and we all wish to be loved and we want and hope to have someone see us and love us. And we read romance because it's comforting. We read romance because the romance novel is important and it contains serious ideas, mostly about women and women's desires. And those desires are not just merely sexual. Those desires are for love and friendship and stability and partnership and workplace success. And we read romance because there's a reliance on emotion And rather than having that scare us, romance readers connect to the emotional journey. Romance readers like feeling things. They like going through the ringer. Um, There's always that third act breakup. And how are they going to get together? I remember reading a book recently that had one of the characters was dead. And I'm like, okay, how's this going to work out? And I just had to let go knowing it's it's a romance. It's going to work. And it did. I'm not going to spoil that for anybody. So, yeah. (laughs) Well, and and that is the definition of a romance is there is a happy ending. You have to you have to have what's called an H E A or H F N, happily ever after or happily for now. Yeah. 
And especially like in YA romance. Got it. It's weird when you have YA romance that's happily ever after. I mean, they're they're 16. So a happily for now is perfect for a YA romance. Yeah. Excellent. So and you you mentioned that you're you really didn't get any pushback from your administration. But when it comes to providing justifications for this club to your administrator, you know, I, I really can't help but think that having our students navigate the the water, you know, sort of the the, the treacherous waters of a, of a relationship, but doing so in the safety of the pages of a book. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, she's, you know, she gets that and she has, you know, grown children, teenage children. She understands um, how important this is. She knows that there's a lot of kids who are reading this, that they want to have a place to talk about romance books. The one that you also have to realize is we're in Portland, Oregon. So weed is legal. The naked bike ride is the thing here. So as Beyonce would say, it's not Texas. So it's a little, a little bit different, a little bit different in Portland. I think people could do this anywhere and maybe just limit it to YA romance. But I have to say when my principal is giving tours and she walks in the library, she will mention the romance book club and people will look at her a little sideways sometimes, but she loves it. She loves that it. It's a thing and that people are talking about it and that kids are reading it. And I've got staff members who are reading the romance books every month who a couple years ago never would have done that. And now they're doing that. And I've got a couple English teachers who text me on the down low. I don't know if they're open to the whole English department about some of the stuff they're reading, but they want to talk to me about Sarah J. Mass books, which sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm here for that. Well, and can I just say how our teachers respond is absolutely vital. I have a Sarah J. Mass reader who talks to me about her reading and she actually said, oh, yeah, my teacher saw that and said, you just like to read it for the dirty parts. And, and I really, I, I, didn't, I didn't pursue this conversation, but I really am disappointed that when a student is reading a book, that the teacher would single out the only reason why anybody would read that book is for the smut. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, and I'm going to say that it's probably a male I would wonder if he would say the same thing. Oh, you're just reading Stephen King's for the scary parts or you're just reading Agatha Christie for like the confusing mystery. Like, I don't get that. And there's so much more to a romance book than sex. And there's but there's lots of closed door romance books that are great that don't feature on page sex. But, you know, I don't know in schools today if we do such a great job of sex education. And if one of the places you're going to learn about sex is in a romance book it's not the worst place to actually be, you know, finding out about what a relationship should look like. Students need to see healthy relationships on the page in relevant contexts, and this helps them make sense of their feelings and their, you know, sexual and romantic feelings. So when you do sex ed in school, you get facts, but you don't have any social context. And in a romance book, you see a whole relationship. And you see that sex is just one part of that relationship. And I think that's really important for a teenage brain to see. Well, and I also consider where else they're seeing it. Yeah, they're, online. they're seeing it online. And, and yeah. unfortunately, what they see online is unfortunately probably not demonstrating a what would be considered a typical teenage, you know, relationship with another, another person. And I, I, I'm sorry, but... You know, I think that if that is your only source of information, you are going to come out of your, your you know, teenage years with a very skewed understanding of what a relationship with another person might look like. And I think as librarians, if we're doing our job, the books that we have on our shelf are going to be representative of, of the, the various relationships that our, our students would have, perhaps, if our, you know, collections are representative with our LGBTQIA content. You know, in this case, this is about building empathy and understanding and compassion for people who experience a romance and, and a relationships that might look different from what we're accustomed to. Right. And also, I mean, one of the big complaints about romance is people say it's pornography. And believe me, romance isn't porn. Pornography is sex, but there isn't a focus on love or emotional connection, which is what's central to a romance. Sex 
on the page and a romance is there to show the developing relationship between the main characters. And it's, you know, most people agree that some sexual tension in a romance is essential, but sex is not essential to a successful romance book. So true. So true. Romance novels and their novelists have had a long history of being considered less than literature, a victim of literacy shaming, and considered not legitimate reading. I'm guessing that you have had to convince some non-believers in your efforts to create a romance book club. Would you share with us some of the things which you have had to explain away or dispel when it came to some of these hard-held stereotypes when it comes to romance novels? Right. Well, there's a lot of shade that gets thrown at romance, and that often means that romance readers are made to feel ashamed of their reading choices, which is the last thing we want for our students. The genre is hugely popular. It's the most popular genre, and it's keeping publishing afloat, but popularity does not equal acceptance. In fact, I think that the genre's popularity is often why it is so belittled. I think that some people think if something is popular, it has to be cheap or easy or stupid, And there's this hot take that romance books are dumb books for stupid people. But believe me, you have smart friends who read romance. You have smart coworkers who read romance. Smart students are reading romance. You have smart family members who are reading romance. And none of them are going to talk to you about it unless you're also a smart person who reads romance or at least doesn't shame anyone for their reading choices. And then people say that romance books are trash because there's often on the page sex. But I don't think the stories about relationships are trash. I don't think stories about people embracing their sexuality to be trash. And people say romance books are silly, frivolous fluff. But there are romance books that deal with serious issues, issues such as disability, chronic pain, addiction, discovering your sexual orientation, mental illness, abuse, and also Don't be inclined to dismiss romance novels as fluff because they're mostly about women. Romance novels are important if you think women are important, if you think women's desires are important, and those desires involve family, love, friendship, work, all sorts of things. People say that romance novels are formulaic. Romance often follows a familiar structure and tropes not unlike most genre fiction. Most good storytelling follows some type of formula, i.e. the three-act structure, This is not unique to romance, and also there is great comfort from the predictability of a formula, which is why people like mysteries and thrillers and all sorts of things like that. So I get faced with a lot of people throwing ideas about romance at me. What's funny is most of those people have never actually read a romance book. So, you know, I'm used to it. Well, and let's not forget that a lot of the romance writers, they are very bright, smart writers. So could you speak a little bit to the surprising fact that many of these romance writers are well-established, you know, in other fields and writing is just something else they do? I'll be surprised because I have, since attending your session and since learning more about the value of, of romance and how much my students value it. I have made reading romance a very important part of the reading that I do to be able to support my students. And I'm a better librarian because I read romance and I read what my students read so that we can talk about it and I can make smart purchases. But tell us a little bit about these authors because I think listeners would be really surprised to hear some of their backgrounds. So to answer your question, there are some amazingly educated romance authors. For example, Courtney Milan has a master's degree in theoretical physical chemistry from Berkeley. She went to University of Michigan Law School. She clerked for the U.S. Supreme Court. You've got Stacey Abrams, who writes romance as Selena Montgomery. She has a JD from Yale Law School. She was the 2018 Democratic nominee for the governor of Georgia. Allie Hazelwood, who is a favorite of my students, she is an Italian neuroscience professor. Lauren Billings, who writes as one half of the writing duo, Christina Lauren, has a PhD in neuroscience. Eloisa James, who writes lovely historical romance, has degrees from Harvard, Oxford, and Yale. And she is currently the chair of the English department at Fordham University in New York. And Jen Trin has a PhD in physics from UC Santa Cruz. That is just a few 
of the authors that I highlight in my romance presentation. I, again, you know, to to cast any sort of shade on on writers and as, make generalizations about what they do based on the content that they write about is, is we're really doing a disservice to authors everywhere to make those kinds of assumptions. I'm glad that you raised those because it really does. It is eye opening when you realize that the people who are writing romance have complex and varied backgrounds. And, and I wonder, I imagine many of these things find their way into their storylines and it makes them all the more, you know, interesting and accessible. So I, I'm really grateful you mentioned that because for me, at least, it really does, you know, open my eyes to what I, I clearly have been missing for a long time. Right. Rachel Katz, who's the author who we have coming um, for an in-person visit in April, who is actually Lincoln High School alum, she recently got her PhD. Um, I believe she graduated MIT, just got a PhD from, I think, University of Washington. These romance writers, she decided to write romance during COVID. These writers are no slouches. That's fantastic. You know, you mentioned that you're in Portland. It sounds like you, you've been able to have this club without much interference on the part of concerned citizens. I love that you uh, made sure that when we were watching your presentation in Tampa, you talked about, uh, you provided us with some terminology. Uh, you provided us some, some some language that perhaps we don't have if you don't, like me, I haven't, I'm newly uh, I'm minted as a, a romance reader. I definitely did not read a great deal when I was in high school, but as a high school librarian, I have to read it all the time and I'm having so much fun. You know, you mentioned something about subgenres of romance and this is new information for me. I think if our listeners had a, a better understanding of all the different types of subgenres, they might see how appealing this, this you know, reading romance could be for our students writ large. Right. So there's lots of different types of romance books. You've got suspense, dark romance, paranormal romance. There's a new category kind of called horror romance, um, which goes along with the new romanticy. There's monster romance. The monsters can be anything goes, baby. There's contemporary romance, of course historical, Western, young adult, inspirational slash Christian romance, rom-coms, category romance are kind of like your older Harlequins. There's erotic romance, which we don't touch anywhere, but lots of different subgenres. And then with the, you know, within your subgenres, then you've got all the different tropes of romance and everyone has like their favorite and their least favorite trope. I mean, I think for a lot of my LGBTQ students, found family is one of their favorite tropes. Um, which is one of my favorite as well. Could you explain that? What What is the found family trope? Yeah. Found family, because a lot of times, um, you know, students who are not in cisgender heterosexual relationships kind of lose their birth family, um, is not supportive of them. So found family are their friends. And you see a lot of this in um, like Casey McQuiston books, One Last Stop, you see the main character in that book kind of moves into a new apartment and those roommates become her found family. So that is, that's a great trope. You also have one of the tropes, uh, a popular trope for a lot of people is workplace romance. Um, my high school students, they're not really interested in that, which is fine. I get that. Arranged marriage is a trope. Again, not one that's really, you know, teenagers are not into. Um, you've got slow burn can be a trope. Grumpy um, versus, you know, sunshine is a trope. Secret identity, age gap. Again, that's one that we don't touch in the high school. You've got brother's best friend, friends to lovers, fake relationship, forced proximity. One of my favorite tropes is I hate everyone but you because pretty much I hate everyone. So I can relate really well to that trope. People also have like least favorite tropes. My least favorite tropes are secret baby and anything that has to do with a billionaire. Also teacher student. Teacher student romance. Yeah, no, not happening. So I have to ask you, Lori, it is, I've also encountered, because I've genrefied my collection, I have a relationship slash identity section. So romance would fall in the, the relationship slash identity uh, collection. But it is interesting because it also has many of those sci-fi components 
And you mentioned uh, a couple of them when we're talking about sort of a sci-fi twist, when we're talking about See You Yesterday, which is with Rachel Lynn Solomon, and it's all about the first day of college, which I I have in my collection. And it's so much fun because a lot of our uh, kids are are graduating and getting ready to go to school. I said, well, this book is entirely about the first class that you've ever gone to in college on the first day of school. Uh, The other one that you mentioned already, um, Casey McQuiston's One Last Stop, which is very sci-fi. And so I, I have it sort of actually, you know, in both sections of the library. So speaking of those books, we've had Casey McQuinston, Aidan Thomas, who wrote Cemetery Boys, and Rachel and Solomon, who wrote See You Yesterday and Today, Tonight, and Tomorrow as well, who also has an upcoming, I think, sequel to that book. Um, they've all been visitors to the Romance Book Club. Aidan lives just down the hill from me, and we kind of figured that out from sleuthing on their Instagram. I could see their view, and I'm like, I know that bridge that they're looking at out of their living room window during COVID. And so then when we were back in school, one of my students reached out and said, would you like to come to a romance book club meeting? And they were so great. And we were their very first in-person event. They had released two books during COVID, had not met with any fans. And that was really fun. And then there's an adult author who lives in Vancouver, just across the river from Portland, Alison Cochran, who had a book that came out during COVID, which was a great book. And we were her first person, her first in-person event as well. Um, and she's gone, on, she's gone on to great success too. So um, it's really fun to have those authors, you know, show up. And it was kind of, you know, they loved us and we were really loving on them. <laughs> well, and friends, Lori's so incredible. You were able to bring Aiden to the uh, conference. You presented a, a, a Q&A with Aiden Thomas. And I was just... Yeah, that was very last minute. That was amazing. <laughs> I was just absolutely yeah. just jaw dropped, watched you do this interview with Aiden Thomas. He's such an yeah. inspirational writer. And I'm so excited. He's one of those people I will read everything that they write. Yeah. So I, I absolutely thought it was fantastic. So I love that there are subgenres because we have students who are very picky. And it sounds like we are able to sort of, uh, you know, move across all sorts of uh, areas of interest for our students. I'm hoping you can walk us through your romance book club. Could you give us an idea? We've talked a little bit about that you meet sort of on an infrequent basis. Can you give us in terms of your student leadership? Do you have a core group of students who do make some of those collective decisions with you? Do you have a, a board, like a president of the you know, Romance Book Club? How do you and the students make decisions about what you want to do each year? Yeah. So there's a couple leaders every year. And we just kind of talk about like, you know, what's coming up? What are we looking at? I get a lot of arcs, mostly electronic arcs from publishers, which is great. And so I will often suggest something that I know is coming out and say, this is going to be really great. Sometimes I'll look and see um, Junior Library Guild, and I'll see, oh my gosh, they've got, you know, $6 copies of this Lynn Painter book. Let's get a whole bunch of those. You know, that'll be cheap, and those come right away. So we've been lucky with that. So we kind of do it collectively. Sometimes I'll really push for something, and other times, you know, they'll push for something that they really want to have coming up. So it just kind of depends. We're, we just kind of go with the flow, which is good. I think if it was just me shoving books down their throat, it wouldn't be as successful. And also, Sometimes they've chosen some things that have, you know, come out to be some real stinkers. So (laughs) it works well when it's, you know, me working with them, coming up with stuff. I mean, they know what they like and I know what I like, but I also kind of know what, you know, high school students like to read. You know, I have a an idea that perhaps you didn't have as large a group in the beginning, in the early years as you do now. Can you give us an idea of how many books you purchase when you do a book with your book club? Yeah, it varies. So sometimes, I mean, we've had meetings where we've had like just a handful of kids show up and then we've had meetings where we've had like 80 to 100 kids show up. So it really does depend. We had a meeting the other day, Lynn Painter appeared virtually and I think we had close to 50 kids show up. So it just depends. So if it's a YA title, I can blow a bunch of money on it out of my budget. And so maybe I'll buy like 10 or 12 copies If it's an adult book, that we have to use other funding sources. So I don't use taxpayer dollars on adult romance books and we don't stamp them. 
I don't want anyone picking up a book that has, you know, it's an adult romance with sex on the page and then waving it around and saying, look what they're reading in Lincoln High School, which, okay, yeah, we're, we're reading that. But, you know, I don't need another excuse for someone to come after me. I managed to get in plenty of trouble as it is. So that's when we make the book turkeys at Thanksgiving or we make the book snow people or the pumpkins very successful. We sell those and we make a surprising amount of money that we're able to use um, to purchase those books. And also like I'm, I'm big at ordering through Ingram. And so it's a, you know, it's a heftier discount than my bookstores would give me and they ship stuff out in two days. So we can make a decision on the fly and have books right away. That's absolutely huge. I, it, you've, you've found ways to work with the system to make sure that you can continue to provide this program for your students without creating unnecessary or unwanted, uh, you know, sort of attention from groups who are not so much in favor of, of student freedom when it comes to reading books. Right. No, I love romance books, but I also love my job and I'm not going to put myself in peril for that. Yeah. Lori, you work with a core group of kids who absolutely love to read romance and they love having a safe place to talk about this. I'm fascinated because you've had some great luck bringing in authors, both in person and remotely. What are some other things that your students like to do to celebrate romance books? Right. So we've made we've made romance stickers before on Canva and then we print them out in the makerspace. We've actually hosted with the Portland Book Festival. They always put out a call for different events and we've hosted um, events in our library. I think one year we, call, we called it Fall Into Romance and we opened it up to the public and it was great. A bunch of people came. We had heart-shaped cookies, you know, pink and red decorations and everything. And it was really fun because there were some older couples that came in that were on like the literary arts, which is the big foundation, you know, that brings in authors and stuff in our town. And they had never read romance and they had questions. And it was great because my students were schooling them about romance. And then there were other, then there were other community members who came in who were just like, you know, romance readers and wanted to talk. And that was really fun. I want to do more events like that where we bring romance readers together into our beautiful library. Well, and it's a wonderful opportunity to showcase a public, I mean, the, you're, you work in a public school and when you've got your, your taxpayers who are excited to see how incredible your space is, I was, it's just jaw-droppingly beautiful, friends. And I, I had an opportunity to explore it. So I, I can imagine anything we do that makes sure that we showcase our, our beautiful spaces where our students can learn is, is always going to be, you, you make the school district look good when you do that. So, you know, I'm guessing your students have strong opinions when it comes to TikTok in their role in promoting romance novels. How have they felt about TikTok and the books that you decide to read? I mean, we've, some of the books we've chosen have been, you know, like TikTok books that have, you know, gotten their, their start there. I did have some kids um, who wanted me to get some of the Hannah Grace books. I'm blanking on their titles right now. One's, there's a hockey one and then Wildfire, I believe. And I said, no, we're not doing those books. You can read those. We're not going to have those in the library. And I just, I don't think there's a lot of literary merit to those books. But sometimes they bring in stuff. I mean, I think almost all high school librarians must have kids who come in at least once a week and show them a screenshot of a book on their phone saying, do we have this? And I'm happy when we do. And then a lot of times I have to explain why we don't and that our public library does. I found a book that I read recently that was on TikTok that I would, I don't think I'd have the romance. It was a book um, a romance between two serial killers who kill other serial killers. The trigger warnings, content warnings were extensive. It was great. I loved it. <laughs> People can DM me if they want the title of this book. It was awesome. I recommend the, um, to listen to it. And um, that's another thing I do is I highly recommend you, um, Libro FM getting on there using the um, educator or librarian membership to Libro FM. And a lot of times I will find out about books before they're released and I'll listen to them. Um, that's a great place to find out about new romance. And they have a, a fair amount of romance that they put out every month that I can just access for free. Well, and friends, we'll put a link in the show notes 
because I am absolutely addicted to Libro FM. At the first of the month, I'm 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 going through my emails, waiting for that link, and then you can download. And and you have those titles forever. They don't they don't disappear. So once you access your Libro FM books, you have them. Um, and that's how I that's part of my homework as a, as a school librarian. I look through their YA titles. I look through their LGBTQIA titles. And I also you know now I'm going to be looking through their romance. grateful for some of these strategies. Would you touch upon the idea of new adult versus young adult? Because I know for a lot of us who teach in high school, we are we sort of fall into two camps. Those of us who have Colleen Hoover in our collections and those of us who do not. Uh, and, and sort of the rationale for why. I will be very forthcoming, friends. I have a very small collection and I very recently received a, a, a grant to buy some new books. And just focusing on YA, I am barely sort of scratching the surface of the kinds of titles that my students deserve to have. When my students came in and asked for Colleen Hoover, I, I explained that those were new adults, meaning the protagonist is much older than, than our teenagers, usually by a decade. But had to explain that when I have this much money, my ability to invest in books which address a much older audience, is it's just there isn't enough money right now. And maybe that's the cowardly way out. But I'm focusing on young adult. Right. And there's a lot of great young adult romance coming out. So I think that's a fine thing to focus on. I have a few Colleen Hoover books in my library, not a ton. It seemed like they were getting checked out like crazy last year. This year's been a little bit slower. I have some Allie Hazelwood adult books in my library, you know, a few other adult romance authors we've got in there. I guess the kids are more interested in well-written adult romance. Um, and some of the new adult just isn't, the literary merit and quality isn't quite there. I'm not making a blanket statement of that. I don't go around searching out new adult. I mean, I when I was a middle school librarian, the middle schoolers all wanted to read YA. And then when you're in high school, the high schoolers all want to read adult. And so you have to just to say, like, you know, enjoy being 16. There's great YA books here that are going to speak to you, that are talking about things that you're going through. You don't need to read about some unhappy, you know, 40-year-old in publishing. Like, I'll read that stuff. I, I recently I was reading some some Colleen Hoover, uh, really purely for, you know, uh, because I, I needed to read some Colleen Hoover. All my students were asking about it. It seemed like so many of those characters were in their late 20s. They had already uh, failed at one, one uh, you know, uh, relationship or another. They were moving in uh, to uh, an apartment and possibly with another person and their, their careers were just getting started. They're out of college at this point. And all my readers are like 16, 17, and no one's been to college yet and reading about books where the, the main characters are, you know, almost a decade older than they are. Yeah. And a lot of her characters seem really toxic. So it's unfortunate. The students who check out Colleen Hoover books in my library, they have to listen to me, talk to them for a minute or two and say, I love this for you. I get that you want to feel all the feelings. I mean, these are the kids who say, I want a sad book which I don't like sad books, but I get that people want a sad book. You want to feel things. So I will give them the book, but then I have to explain these are not healthy relationships in these Colleen Hoover books. These are red flags. I mean, I hope that you learn something like do not look for people that are in these books. These are, it's, it's not healthy. So if you can use that to like learn something from then I guess that's okay. So they'll stand there and listen to me. I'm sure they're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, just, just give me my book already. But that's my trying to make the world world a better place. And at least, you know, they're reading. So that's good. And I don't disagree. And I, I when I taught littles, I they all wanted to read scary books. Right. And and I put uh, on the bookshelf, I said, may cause nightmares. And I did that because you, you'd better believe I had more than a few uh, parents who would send me emails and saying, hey, please stop sending, you know, uh, it was... American Chillers, Michigan Chillers. It was, you know, but my students were asking for my Pennywise section. 
Mrs. Herman, where's your Pennywise section? I was like, nope. Not happening. <laughs> I don't have I don't have Stephen King at the elementary school. Uh, and you know what? There, there's a reason why, you know. But I, I think as as librarians, when we're working with our students and and especially when it comes to adult content, I think we owe it to our students to give them some context. Um, you know, I always let them know if they're checking out. And you mentioned Song of Achilles. I just said, you know, this is sort of Percy Jackson. And it's a little steamy. It's a little steamy. I'm not going to lie. And I, I've had some students who loved, uh, by the same token, uh, Circe uh, also, um, because they're learning about you know, you know, mythology and, and Homer's Odyssey in, in, their, in their literature classes. Mm -hmm. And this is not your Edith Hamilton's, you know, Greek mythology. <laughs> this, is, this is something with a little meat on it. And yeah. And yeah, I'm never going to judge someone for what they want to read. If someone wants to read Colleen Hoover book from now until the rest of their lifetime, that is fine. I'm not going to shame them. I'm just going to say, like, you know, just be careful. This is, you know, there's a lot of unhealthy things that happen in these books. But a lot of times they will read the Colleen Hoover book and, you know, they'll read like I think I've got like four or five. And then I'll say, hey, how do you feel about trying, you know, this book? You know, what do you think about this? So and then we move along into other things. Um, sometimes that's successful. Sometimes it's not. You know, you just do what you can do. Do you genre -fy yeah. your fiction? I have not yet. We spent. I've been at the school for six years. And so it took me a little bit kind of get in there, know my collection. And then we had to move. So the move was really huge. And now I'm in the midst of a gigantic nonfiction weed. And I'm thinking that next year we will start the process of genre -fying. So I, I have to ask, uh, you know, you're sort of, we're, we're in the, you know, it's springtime and we're moving into what would be the last quarter of the school year. What are some things you have planned for your romance book club? And can I ask, you know, when it comes to your students making plans, what kinds of things do they want to do moving forward with the romance book club? So they're talking about having a maybe a viewing party for season three of Bridgerton, which I think would be really, really fun. That's one of my favorite Bridgerton books. I know in April we have an author who's going to be coming in person. Her name is Rachel Katz. She wrote a book recently called Thank You for Sharing. And she actually happens to be Lincoln alum, which is crazy. So that's going to be super, super fun. She's going to be in town for Passover in April. So that'll be great. And then I found out about a local author. Her name is Jen Comfort. She wrote a book called What is Love? It's already gotten two starred reviews. It's been blurred by Christina Laura, and it's super cute. It's got this the cartoon illustrated cover with it looks like two people playing Jeopardy. And it's got the female main character has ADHD and she can retain all these trivia facts. And kids are super excited. I think it's an Amazon first reads. So some of my students who have Prime are really excited to read that. She's going to be coming in May. And then we still have school for a bunch of June. I don't know what June holds. We'll just leave that open in there. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. But we can be sure that you'll be hosting the Romance Book Club next year. Yes, I hope to. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Can I just ask, you know, you've been doing this for a number of years. Can you give listeners some advice as to what you feel you has really made this successful for you when it comes to hosting this club in your school community? I think doing it as a partnership with the students is what makes it successful. It's not my club. I make suggestions. I try and like guide them and steer them, you know, to things. But, um, you know, it's it's what they want to do. And we wouldn't have a club if there weren't a bunch of students who wanted to read romance and then come and talk about it. Having a supportive administration is really helpful. Having supportive staff members. I love it that, you know, my colleagues are really into what's going to be the new book. What are you what's what's happening now. I love that. So I've just been really fortunate. But I honestly think anyone could do this. Just one or two students who like to read romance, being open to reading romance. You don't have to be a huge romance reader. And I read lots of stuff. Right now I'm on Alan's Amelia Elizabeth Walden Committee. So I am reading an insane amount of YA, which is actually cutting into my romance reading, sadly. But I'll recover. So many books and so few hours in the day. And if you're... I think you're an audio fan like like I am. I, I listen to a, a great deal. That's how I get a lot read. Thank you, Libro FM. Uh -huh. So 
you know, Lori, I'm so excited we were able to reconnect. I am grateful because I knew when I saw you had a, a romance book club display up in your library when I was walking through. It was like, it looked wonderful. And I think there are a lot of kids who really could connect with that, especially because they're not meeting. It's it's not like a weekly commitment. It's something that they can sort of work into all the other obligations that they have. So, you know, Lori, I'm, I'm grateful you were able to share this time with us. Would you uh, let listeners know how can we reach out to you uh, if we have other questions? Um, would I have the energy? I'm on Instagram at LHS Library Lori. I'm very sporadic. Sometimes I really make a big effort and then other time weeks go by. So that's pretty much it. And I TikTok seems very counterintuitive to my old lady brain, but um, maybe I'll put myself out there sometime. I don't know. We'll see. Well, and I'm guessing that you've mentioned some of the things that you fundraise on, some of these book creations, which you have sort of up, <laughs> upcycled. Am I correct? Upcycled. Yes. Your, these are upcycled books. And so, I, friends, I would recommend that you follow her on Instagram for examples of the things that you have been able to to sell uh, and fund your your sort of purchases that you've done for this club. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's fun making that stuff. I'm very fortunate. I have, I think, 25 library TAs. Being a library TA, it's the only graded TA class in the school. So there's a lot of people who want to be my library TAs. And when they're my library TAs, they have to read a book every month and they have to write me a letter about that book. It's very informal. It's just kind of like, dear Lori, here's the book I read, their thoughts, you know, who would like that book. But then they also have to make things for me. So they have to make stickers. Um, we made lanterns for the Winter Light Festival a few years ago. That was really tricky. They hated doing it, but that turned out really cool. And then they also have to make book turkeys, pumpkins, snow people. Yeah. So I, having that manpower really helps. Well, and it just demonstrates uh, just how much they love the program that you provide. And it's a space they want to be in. And that's a tribute to you. Oh, thank you. Have a great evening. I will. Thanks. You too, Amy. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews help others find us. A couple friendly reminders, friends. Use the code UNITED to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more. And librarians who book their very first Literati Book Fair and mention the code UNITED when booking may qualify to receive a $500 gift card to Tidal Wave. Visit the link in today's show notes and call the Literati team to see if you qualify. I hope you will consider sending in your voice message and have your say on the next podcast episode. Visit the link in today's show notes. The topic of our next episode will be grant writing and my conversation with Keely Nudo. I hope you will tune in. 